nanohub.org. You can follow along with this presentation using printed slides from the NanoHub. Visit www.nanohub.org and download the PDF file containing the slides for this presentation. Print them out and turn each page when you hear the following sound. Enjoy the show. So this is lecture 38 and we'll be talking about modern MOSFET. Modern meaning the design considerations which are about let's say 20 years old. What I told you is when I was born, this many of these things when I told you. And, but now these things maybe when you were born and we, we'll see how it works. So the first thing is the short channel effect. You know, the transistor is made getting smaller and smaller every day. Right? Started with several microns of channel length, source to drain. Nowadays, 20 nanometer, 20 nanometer, I mean, 20 nanometer is probably on the order of uh, 100 atoms or 200 atoms. It's very, very small. And um, how they make transistors out of it. You know, I have worked in this field for a long time. Still, I cannot believe that they can make these things happen. Now, I'll talk about uh, control of the threshold voltage. And now when you make short channel, then how you lose control of the threshold voltage and how you bring back the control. Uh, we'll talk about how making transistors smaller is no longer working very, very much anymore and why people are sort of trying all sorts of ways to increase the current of the transistor by mobility enhancement and then uh, I'll conclude. So we have talked about the threshold voltage. Let me talk a little bit about the channel length and what effect that has on the threshold voltage. Looks like the threshold voltage should not even know about channel length. Right? Threshold voltage depends on phi sub s, the bulk doping. Why do I care about the channel length? Uh, let, let me show you how it works. That's your MOSFET on the left. Uh, the two blue regions are source and drain. The bulk is this uh, uh, magenta, or I don't know, maybe light red colored region. And the uh, light blue region, you see, that's the depletion. Do you see why the depletion is two or more in the body? rather than in source and drain, because source and drain are very heavily doped. Do you remember that if you have a heavily doped source and a lightly doped region, depletion goes into the, the body region, so substrate region. So it, that's why I have shown the blue primarily in, this, in, this, uh, uh, in the bulk region. Now, if you look at the threshold, if you go ahead and measure this threshold as a function of channel length, so you make various transistors of different channel lengths, now starting from very long to gradually make them small, you will see a strange thing. And the strange thing is that first of all, you might have expected that your threshold voltage will be equal to two phi sub f. And if the bulk is N type, uh, I'm sorry, the bulk is uh, accepted type Na, then you would put the corresponding sign over there for charge QB, bulk charge, QNA WT. What is the WT? WT is the depletion, right? How far it has gotten depleted. C oxy, you know how to calculate. So you'd have gotten a threshold voltage. But you see, you'd have expected that this, since there is no channel length involved here, that the whole, no matter how big, 10 micron or 500 uh, angstrom you make, channel length you make, threshold voltage you'll be measuring by the CV characteristics. Remember, they will be all the same. That's what you expect. But if you really do this measurement, what we'll see that that the threshold voltage will remain more or less independent up to a point, and then it will begin to roll over. And that's what is called the VT roll, roll off. Very important problem. Now, this is something we did not expect. We didn't expect, but this is a big problem. And what I want to calculate is that how much is that and why that happens. That's what I am after. Okay. Now, let's see how, how where that comes in. Now, Another thing is, again, for the short channel, and I'll explain how the roll-off comes in, but the consequence of roll-off, there are many, but there's another effect, that when you apply a large drain bias, then in the long channel, you have this IDVG characteristics. Do you remember subthreshold slope? It cannot be less than 60 millivolts per decade. Hendrik Schoen got into trouble if he tried to do it less than 60 millivolt per decade. There are ways to make it 60 millivolt per decade, by the way. But 
for the time being for semi classical transistors you cannot make it less than 60 millivolts per decade okay so you have that characteristics and if you make the channel too small then what's going to happen the gate will lose control because essentially what will happen that the current will just just like a bipolar transistor gate is trying to control on the top so he says okay fine the electrons pays respect to the gate on the top but sort of underneath through the depletion region it just bypasses the gate altogether as a result what will happen that your current even when the gate voltage is low but by just by using a large drain bias you can have a current flow which is not very good you see this is something very bad because even when you turn the transistor off you'll have a certain amount of current and that's really power dissipation in your computer that's not good we don't want power dissipation when i don't want uh, the transistor switching on and off right so even with vg equals 0 in short channel transistors i have this punch through effect and i'm in trouble so that's something i do not want oh, by the way do you also see the threshold voltage has shifted the threshold voltage is a point where about a microamp per micron that current flows and you can see the red has that same amount of current at a lower voltage lower gate voltage so that is what threshold voltage is so your threshold voltage has rolled off this is the consequence of it okay so what does it come from a few lines of algebra again very simple just pay attention you will see you see the gate essentially uh, has control only over that part that part of the channel do you realize because what about the part which is directly under the rectangle of the gate but in the light blue the reason is that of course the source and drain voltage has more control over that region so the gate they are every point the gate and source are fighting for control every point on the drain side the drain and the gate are fighting for the control for the electrostatic control who controls it and of course in the gate therefore wins in some places when it's closer and loses in some places when it's farther out now therefore the charge over which gate has control is this qb short short channel meaning in a short region you can see the yellow region will be slightly different had it been the long long channel compared to the long channel i am coming to that in a second so that region i wanted to say, say that sort of gate doesn't have control the drain has control that little red triangle that i just saw show, showed you how much area does the gate has have control you can easily calculate let's calculate the area of the uh, trapezoid do you agree z is the width width in the uh, in the other direction l is the length right l prime l plus l prime divided by 2 do you agree when you have trapezoid don't you take the two sides and divide by the two and what is the height the height is wt that is the height and then you take the average and qna and the z is the width in the other direction perpendicular to the flow of current so you do the do the math uh, and then by the way c ox do you see from the c ox i i will also pick up an l so correspondingly here you have the corresponding charge so i have l plus l prime divided by 2l if my l was huge and l prime almost comparable then it would be 2l divided by 2l it would be 1 and i get back my long channel limit do you see that so that is exactly what will happen because you see in this case the trapezoid and the rectangle is about the same and again you can see in here you can do the long channel one in the long channel one l is almost equal to n prime if you have 10 micron and then 10 micron my minus 40 nanometer you know because of the depletion right, that's about 10 micron so therefore in this case you will get back the original one so how is the difference between the threshold between these two well there you can just subtract if you subtract then you will pick up a l prime plus l divided by 2l on the right hand side if l prime is smaller than l then you can see there will be delta vth and therefore there will be a roll off so the physics of roll off is you are losing control of the part of the channel and that's why the threshold voltage is no longer what you calculated for the bulk semiconductor now i'm not done yet l prime uh, is 
uh, something, I have to calculate. How do I do that? Well, this is a very simple geometry. If you just pay attention, you will find out. I want to calculate L prime. Do you realize that this, the difference of the two trapezoid, it will be L minus L prime. And I have half of it, so I'll divide by two. That's the difference. Let me show you here. Let's look at the green triangle. RJ is a junction curvature, right? That depends on how you have deposited your uh, substrate. I'm sorry, source. So that's RJ, and we can calculate it just from the morphology. WS, can you calculate it? Of course you can calculate. That's the amount, as soon as you know the doping, you know what the depletion is. So the hypotenuse will be RJ plus WS, right? So you can see on the left-hand side of the equation, I have, it's a Pythagoras thing. So RJ plus WS squared, what is the height? WT, right? So that's the perpendicular. WT squared, and do you see that the base is RJ, because that's the circle that goes through, plus L minus L prime divided by 2, right? Because L minus L prime is the whole difference. It is shared between source and drain. So L minus L prime divided by 2, that's it. And so you can calculate L prime from here. Do you see, do you know everything? Of course, RJ you know. Yes, from the curvature it will be given. WT is a depletion. You know how to calculate WT, right? the band bending at 2 phi sub f, so you know how to do that, and you can calculate it, insert it in this expression, and you know how much threshold voltage you are going to have in order to, uh, for a given structure, for a given RJ, and for a given channel length. This is how much you would have. Now, what will happen that you want it small, right? Because I don't want threshold voltage to roll off. I want it to be flat. And now, if I want that, then I want that, let's say 10%, I will allow only 10% roll off. So I will put this delta VTH, let's say original delta VT was 60 millivolts, 0.6 volts, let's say, and I want 10% of it. So I will put 60 millivolts here and try to optimize everything on the other side so that my it never goes above 60 millivolts. That's what I want. So you can see immediately, what will you have to do, uh, even before I go anywhere, in order, to, uh, in order to keep it small? First thing is, you'll have to keep RJ very small, if you could. That means very sh shallow source and drain. Therefore, on all modern transistors, they will tell you that we have a modern process in which instead of using boron, I am, we are using a composite of boron which doesn't diffuse as fast, or they are using laser annealing so that it doesn't diffuse much. They are just trying to make RJ as small as possible. It doesn't diffuse too much. And so you'll have to, and when we are going to talk about it, but you get the idea that we are going to uh, work on this formula so that I never exceed alpha naught, so that uh, my roll off doesn't happen. I have good control over my transistor. So there are many ways. So first of all, now the alpha naught, I have brought it to the other side. And the L I have taught, uh, taught, uh, taken, to the, uh, taken to the left hand side. This is the same expression as before. Now this one tells me that even in this case for a given structure, if I know an alpha naught, it tells me what is the minimum channel length I should be able to use for a given technology. Right? Given maximum, no problem. Minimum is this much. So this is what I was telling you. That how would you make, you want L min to be as small as possible. If you could, you would make it zero, so that it's flat all the way through. How would you make that? You will make RJ as small as possible. That's the shallow junction technology, the FinFET and others that people will talk about, and I'll discuss it in a little later. All controlling R sub J is a very important thing. You do that. Second is, what are you going to do about WT? If you want to make WT small, what do you do? You increase the doping. Therefore, every technology generation that the doping of the substrate is gradually increasing, right? You want WT to be small. But then there is, of course, a problem in terms of junction breakdown because if you put too much uh, doping, do you remember the electric field becomes very high and then the impact ionization may start? So you don't want to go overboard. And you want CEOX to be large, right? 
large. So then therefore epsilon at A over D, D is the thickness. You, if you want large capacitance, then you want smaller thickness. And that's what the, therefore you, people are keep making the gate capacitance smaller, smaller, and smaller. Started from maybe on the order of 2000 angstrom, 3000 angstrom in 1960s. Today it is 10 angstrom, size of your DNA. One, one strand of the DNA, that is how thick it is these days. And then of course higher K dielectric because epsilon if you increase, that also increases capacitance, that also makes L mean small and we want real small in mean. So I will go through them one at a time. So one thing people do in order to control threshold because in any way you want, I just a few side things, is something they do that instead of having one gate, Many times people would put two gates. You see on the top gate, do you see blue is the body, thickness of Ta, and then you have an oxide Tox and the Vg, that's the, uh, the, and the gate is in black. But instead of just having the gate on one side, uh, you have gate on both sides. Why do I have that? Because I can have better control over the channel. This is called a SOI, silicon on insulator. So the bottom left side could be an insulator, could be a gate. Now, in this case, what happens that I just told you about this part and then there are regions outside the control of the gate that is causing us problem, right? We, we discussed that and I will come back to, to that problem again. But if you have a sort of a substrate, first of all, that region, uh, the insulator, wherever that stops, depletion cannot go any further, right? Otherwise, it would have kept going. So instead of WT being the relevant depletion, it cannot go beyond T silicon. Whatever is the T silicon, it will stop there because there is no charge in the insulator. So therefore, it will stop there. So you can immediately see why the WT will now become replaced by T silicon and that's good because that can be very small. You can make it very small without the help of doping, right? And so that's a good thing. And also if you have a bottom gate in addition, then what will happen that the bottom gate will want to control from the other side. It's like having two kings and the same land. So now the remote lands are also being controlled by the other king, sort of. And as a result, you have this entire region now under the control of the both gates and uncontrolled region is much smaller. And as a result, this would have a much better threshold characteristics. Do you see that? Now, of course, these type of things are often done. Uh, I promised you in the beginning of the semester that by the time we are done, remember that I had showed you all sorts of pictures and I said that by the time you are done, you will understand them all. So this is my last promise and last picture. Do you see that from here, this is called a fin fed. This has different names, omega fed, x fed, and all those things. Physics is the same. They know, have different names because they, Everybody has their own, every company has their own patent. And if they use FinFET, the name say FinFET, they will have to give each other royalty. So uh, therefore the names are different. But the essential, the details are exactly the same. It's a lot of money by the way, so I understand why they change names. Source on the left side, drain on the right hand side, and it's like as if a car is going under a bridge. And so the electron goes from there to there, source to drain. And the gate is on the top like a, uh, like a bridge surrounding from all three sides. So I just so showed you a two-sided gate. But this is sort of a three-sided gate surrounding you from all sides. And as a result, what happens when the electron goes from the source to drain, this is a perpendicular cut from source to drain. The green is a fin. You know, it looks like a fin of a shark. So it's a fin and the electrons are sort of controlled by all three sides. So therefore, it has a much better threshold voltage control and as a result, you can scale this much smaller than compared to planar transistor. So you see that, right? From three sides, you are sort of surrounding it. Omega is almost like symbol omega. It's almost like from all four sides, you are sort of trapping it. So the source and drain doesn't have much control at all. But there are problems. If you make this very thin, again, this quantization and other things comes in. Because if you make this very thin, then what will happen? Do you remember this formula a long time ago that you thought you never need again? 
uh, those are there will be bound levels, uh, quantization will occur, square well, this is in silicon, green regions are silicon, and as a result what will happen that if you make things very small, your band gap will now be from E1, this bottom of the EC is no longer available, the first le available level is at E1 and your band gap will keep changing. So if you make a little error in the processing, uh, let's say by one nanometer, then your band gap is sort of varying all over. And if your band gap is varying all over, your threshold voltage is varying all over and therefore you will not have a good technology. So therefore it's a challenging thing, but of, of course it, it helps out, okay. So this is the new band gap. By the way, do you know what will be the intrinsic carrier concentration now in the presence of E1 and E18? So this will be Ni square will be Nc Nv, yes, E to the power Eg, but that Eg is not the, your old Eg. This is Eg prime because things have quantized and electron cannot sit in the bottom of the conduction band. And there is another problem. Uh, these are all modern transistors problem that one has to solve. The other problem is that these days transistors are very small. Let's say 20 micron by 20 micron by, by this. Now if you multiply, if you have a doping of 10 to the power 17, and if you calculate how many, tra uh, how many atoms you have, many times you have just on the order of hundreds or so, physical atoms, because 20 is a very small, right? And so 20 by 20, let's say this is the SRAMs are the minimum size transistor, this is a type of memory. And those are very small area. So every transistor have a different number of dopant atoms. If they have the different number of dopant atoms, that means their doping density, if you divide by the volume, is different. If your doping density is different, your threshold voltage is different, right? Every transistor, therefore, nowadays, have different threshold voltage because it's so small. These are all consequence of short channels, right? If your channel was 10 micron long, 10 on the other side, who cares? You have millions of atoms. It is only when you try to make things small, short channel effect, these are the consequences of it. And there are lots of people make a, uh, make a lot of work on this. This is an empirical formula from IBM. And those rate points that you see, those are not electrons. Those are actually the dopant atoms. The blue you see, those are the dopant atoms. And you can see in a small structure, those are countable number. And as it's getting smaller, this fluctuation, and this is the Gaussian curve associated with this fluctuation. So the mean threshold voltage is 275 millivolts. But you can see some transistors have 175 millivolts and some have more than 325 millivolts on the x-axis. So if you try to make a transistor a circuit out of it, then you see you will be in trouble because everybody wants to turn on at a different point. And that's the problem uh, because every transistor is different and if every transistor is different, everybody has a different drive current and short channel transistor is a, it's a very difficult problem uh, to work on. Now very quickly, uh, I will tell you about how to control this, how to control the short channel effects. The first one is that in the standard one, you cannot really do much except you know the thresh surface potential is 2 phi sub f in this particular case. If you don't have a drain bias, right, you remember that point how much you need to bend the band in order to get inversion. One thing you could do that if your dopant number is sort of uncontrolled, in that case you can get, use the back gate, which is a VBS. You can use the back gate to control the threshold voltage because if you apply a, so far we have not been talking about the back gate, it was just sitting at grounded at zero potential. However, if you apply a bias on the back gate, then FP, FP will be moving, right? So that's, or here it's written as, I'm sorry. Yeah, the FP is, is will be moving that, that, so it has been sort of, if you apply a negative bias less than zero, then the FP, the whole FP would move, be moving up. And that's why what you see, right? FP, do you see? That has been moved up from this equilibrium position because it's a negative bias. As a result, you can control the voltage at which the transistor inverts by controlling the back gate bias. So by doing the back gate bias, you can counteract some of the effects of variation due to, due to doping. 
You can also do it by control the threshold voltage by choosing appropriate metal, right? This you know, this is the previous one, probably I needed to explain a little bit more, but this one you, you, you know already, if you choose a particular work function, and that is how the Intel, most recent Intel uh, my, uh, transistors are, that you choose a metal, you see it's no longer silicon, di uh, silicon uh, polysilicon, but rather you choose a metal, and by choosing a metal, do you see that you essentially control the VBI because this metal work function is variable, and therefore you can also control your threshold voltage access because threshold voltage depends on this flat band voltage. And therefore, you know, you can all, all, almost bend it in the very, very beginning as it is here. Or you can move it to the other side. So depending on the control you want, instead of looking at the substrate, which is getting difficult, you can just look at the gate and that gate through the flat band voltage of the gate, you can control the threshold voltage. So that is also a modern way of handling short channel effect. And, and the final point I wanted to make was this thinner gate dielectric and higher gate dielectric constants. Now if you make it, you can of course, what I, what I want to show here, you can of course do that. I'm showing you the problem with it. You can of course make it, you say, okay, I'll, I'm going to make it five angstrom, two angstrom, whatever I want to make it, that will make my L main smaller. That's good. But the problem is that if you try to do that, you know, you already know the problem. That you'll have a huge amount of tunneling current. Yes, you got the short channel. <laughs> it's like uh, jumping from the frying pan into the fire. The, 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 that's, that's exactly what the situation is. Yes, you got rid of the short channel effect, but you made the oxide so thin in the process that then essentially you have a huge amount of tunneling current flowing through. And then, that, therefore, that's not acceptable. That's too much, too much power dissipation. So the final thing uh, is then the, my only remaining option is to increase the dielectric constant. Because if I increase the dielectric constant, I can still keep X not big, right? I can still keep X not big so that my tunnel current is not a problem. But by increasing the dielectric constant, and that's why we use high K dielectric higher than silicon dioxide. Silicon dioxide dielectric constant is 4. So hafnium oxide is about 20, right? So you can, if you put it in, then you can also do smaller L min. And these are all good things, except that high K dielectric has a lot of defects. It's again the other problem. High K dielectric has a lot of defects. And if you put high K dielectric exactly on the silicon surface, then the electrons get scattered by the high K. So that's the problem. And I'll talk about that uh, in, the in the next class. But for the time being, what I wanted to emphasize, stopping here, is, is the issue that short channel control is paramount. You have to do it. Now, you do it by various ways, you know, junction, junction curvature, oxide thickness, and everything. But everything that you do, then there is a price to pay. You have to understand the trade off. And once you understand the trade-off, then you understand the limits up to which you can push a particular strategy. In the end, you'll have to use a combination of all those, and that's what keeps people employed in the industry. So the next topic uh, that we want to discuss is how people are working on mobility enhancement to see whether they can get a better drive current even at short channel transistors. And this is when you have exhausted all possibility related to thinning of the oxide, because if you thin it too much, then there will be too much gate leakage. That's the problem. High K dielectric, yes, you can put it, increase dielectric constants, but there is just too much charge trapping in, uh, in, and voltage instability associated with it. So the only remaining thing is then trying to go for the mobility and see uh, whether you can do something, increase the mobility somehow, somehow so that you can have an enhanced drive current. Remember, drive, enhanced drive current means that you can charge capacitors very easily, and that means you can have higher speed, higher speed of the transistors. Now, the first thing I want to mention that MOS mobility is a little strange. 
uh, this is not something you might have expected from a, from a typical device mobility. On the left hand side, the blues are source and drain, and the yellow is the depletion region. I haven't drawn the inversion region, but we'll assume that there is the inversion region right there underneath the gate. And typically, you might think that the electron will go from source to drain, and therefore, and as they go along, they will be scattered by the ionized impurity. You know, there's this depletion region, lots of ionized impurity. Uh, they'll be scattered by phonons. And if you wanted to know what the mobility of this region is, you could go back to the first part of the course where we actually discussed these particular curves. I, I hope that you remember that this is probably too small to see on the x and y axis. This x axis is doping and the y axis is mobility. And on the top one, uh, the top graph, we have the temperature as a function of mobility. So let's say you are at 300 degree. You could just stay with the bottom plot. And if the doping is, let's say, for example, 10 to the power 18 for electrons, let's say this is an um, NMOS, in that case, you would just come around 10 to the power 18 and correspondingly read off the mobility values. And you might have expected that that's the value that you have to put in your calculations. Not really, because this electrons actually cannot go straight. I mean, electrons never go straight. They scatter back and forth anyway with the three-dimensional lattice. But here we have this additional complication that the gate voltage is asking the electron to get out of the gate, right? Which has a very high electric field. It is asking the electrons to get out of the gate. Now, the insulator is showing, is saying that you cannot go. And so its effort towards the gate will be repeatedly be frustrated by the gate insulator. So it will bump along repeatedly uh, uh, along the gate oxide before it can get out. And that's the rate curve. I mean, the black one is also bumping around. But without an oxide, then you don't have that additional problem of quote unquote surface scattering. Because now it's sort of being pulled very close to the surface. And therefore, there is an additional scattering. Now you realize that if your gate voltage is high, then the electrons will be pulled closer and closer to the surface effectively. And so the effect of this oxide scattering, surface scattering, that will be enhanced. And that is what you see in terms of a mobility field characteristics like this. Let me just explain uh, how these curves are done. The top set of curves are done at 77 degrees C. And each symbol, let's say open circle, the field, field circle, open square, these are done at different densities. And there are two sets of curves. The top set is at lower temperature, 77 degrees C, at 77K, and the bottom one is room temperature, 300K. So these are the two sets. Now the first thing you will notice in comparing between that mobility on the left-hand side plot, and these are, by the way, all for electrons, and the mobility plot that we have seen before is the following. Let's say we want those two. So the one is 4 times 10 to the 15, and the other one is uh, 7 times 10 to the 16. So these two dopings, open square at 300 degree and uh, open circle at 300 degree. So these are two different dopings. You expect that at higher doping, the mobility will be lower, right? Because there are more char charged uh, ionized impurities. So as the electron goes along, they'll be scattered more. Of course, you expect a little bit low. And that is something you have seen on the right hand bottom side as well. Now, if you compare, however, and look at the value, these two red dots, if you look at the value, you will see that approximately it's, the trend is right in terms of that at higher doping, the mobility is a little low, but uh, the factor is off by a factor of two or so because of that surface scattering, right? <laughs> and so that is very important. The other thing that is very important is that you can see at higher field, essentially, the car begins to deviate from the dotted line, dashed, uh, dashed line, and begins to go down very fast. Mobility begins to go down very fast. And that happens because of very strong surface scattering at very high fields. Right? So surface scattering in MOSFET is very important. Wasn't important in bipolar. Why not? Because the current was flowing vertically. There is no surface to think about. So as a result, we have this additional thing. You also realize that at high fields, the doping dependence disappears, right? You see that all the curves are merging together. And this happens because 
at high field essentially surface scattering dominates. As a result, you no longer have the dominance of ionized impurity scattering. Why didn't I see it on the right hand plot? Because remember here, the voltage applied on the drain side sort of was very small and there's no gate field here on the right hand side. So the entire issue about the gate field actually are absent in the right two figures. Remember these two are two terminal registered characteristics, whereas that's the three terminal MOSFET characteristics. So the mobility is very different. Bottom line, you have about on the order of maybe several hundred or so uh, uh, mobility centimeter squared volt second. That's the mobility you have in silicon 100 surface. You remember, right, why it's 100? Because the number of defects on that plane is relatively low. So although you could have higher mobility in other planes, that's what people have historically. That's what they have preferred. Okay, so the MOSFET mobility is different. Now, what are you going to do? How are you going to improve it? Uh, improve this mobility so that you can have more current, right? How are you going to do it? Oh, by the way, so this formula essentially tells you that how the mu naught, which is the standard um, uh, mobility, changes, modifies with the gate voltage Vg. Theta is some parameter, some constant that people people determine. Now, what people do uh, in order to get better mobility is something called a strain, straining the channel and this is how it is done. On the upper side, what you, where you see the red squares, this is supposed to be silicon with a certain lattice spacing. You know, this is an idealized version, a square grid. On the bottom, you have silicon germanium, let's say, a material with slightly lower lattice constant, not too much more, not too small, maybe one to two percent at most. That's how, it's, uh, how the blue squares are different by the red, words, uh, the red squares. Now what happens when you put silicon or the red on that blue and you essentially grow the red ones on top of the blue, since the blue is quite few, large, large number of blue there are and a little bit of, little bit of red, so the red will then try to conform to the lattice spacing of the underlying substrate, right? And what it will try to do then, it will essentially be squished, squished laterally, so that it can fit into this. And of course, in order to, when it gets squished on the laterally, it will expand vertically. That's called this Poisson ratio, that if you squeeze something in one side, it goes out on the other side. So that's called the Poisson ratio. The bottom line here is, as a result of squeezing, this is silicon, yes, but not really, because this lattice spacing is a slightly smaller than silicon, right? As a result, when the electron flows through the red, its band structure will be a little different, the effective masses will be a little different, and therefore when you apply an electric field, there is a possibility, but not always, it doesn't happen always for all materials, but there is a possibility that the effective mass will be reduced, and therefore Q tau divided by M star, that's the mobility and the mobility will be enhanced, right? So this is called a biaxial strain because you are sort of straining it from both sides on the X and Y plane. So that's why it's called biaxial strain and it gives you a huge amount of advantage. By the way, if you keep growing the red on top of the blue, make it very, very thick, then what's going to happen, red is going to say that I'm not going to go with the blue. So it will create a defect in the interface and then it will relax back to its original lattice. So therefore you cannot draw it very thick and there is this something called this critical thickness beyond which you cannot grow. So as a result you have keep this material thin and then you can have a huge advantage. Now how big an advantage? You know there are lots of work uh, going on but I, what I ask you to see on any of this, uh, this work is that look at the top layer which says strained silicon. Strained silicon, see, and the various types of things that people are trying. This is strained silicon, dual channel, heterostructure in the bulk. But the bottom line is for, for this class is that you see that there is a top layer with strained silicon and a layer underneath which is slightly yellowish orange that has a slightly smaller lattice constant. So silicon is forced to conform and as a result its mobility goes up. 
and this is the correspondingly strained silicon you see on the right hand side is schematic diagram uh, and then you correspondingly look at uh, the, uh, the particular device configuration. Everything starts with silicon substrate though. Everything starts there, then you grow silicon germanium which has a small lattice constant and then the strain silicon on the top. Higher mobility, right? How much higher? Oh, by the way, so this is an like a recent experimental device configuration which uses strain uh, here. For example, the yellow part is a polygate and this uh, uh, magenta region is a channel region and the greenish region is a silicon germanium underneath, under layer, which is trying to essentially providing the framework for the silicon to conform to. Now this has tremendous enhancement, tremendous enhancement. So let's first look at the extreme right hand plot and this is the mobility as a function of the electric field, a plot that I just showed. You know, the three slides before when I talked about silicon, surface scattering and all, that is exactly the same one. But this is, I'm just showing the lower effective field part of it. The surface roughness part of it is sort of cut out of this, out of this figure. But you can see here that the strain silicon, which is the field black symbols, can be significantly higher. So for example, more than a factor of two here. Uh, in terms of mobility. So this is a, this is a great, this can be a great device, especially for NMOS, right, NMOSFET. But for PMOSFET, unfortunately, the improvement is not as significant. You can see bulk silicon, well, with strain, you didn't get, get very much. You got from 60 to, or maybe 65 to 75. That's not a huge improvement. You wouldn't go to a new material for that. But for NMOSFET, you can, you see huge, huge improvement, right? So therefore, it makes sense for NMOS. And then there are people who are also doing, instead of stressing it laterally from the bottom and biaxially, here you can see the silicon germanium is sort of on the source and drain side, and the channel is in the middle. Now in this case, the silicon germanium is sort of trying to maintain its space, and the channel is sitting in the middle, so on both sides it's being squished. Right? And it's being squished on both sides. So this is called an uniaxial strain. Because previously it was sort of on the bottom. It provided a template. The top one was sort of sitting on top and it was being squished on both sides in X and Y. But here you put this silicon germanium on source and drain. They have a certain lattice constant and the silicon is sort of sitting in the middle. It's like, you know, two healthy person in the air aircraft and the person sitting in the middle row. That's the silicon, strained silicon. And uh, the strained silicon, therefore, can have very high mobility in this case. So your recent Pentiums will have something like this. But so people are trying everything they possibly can in order to improve mobility. That's the game now. Pres at presently, that's the game people are uh, trying to play. For example, this must be a blast from the past. Remember this 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0 planes and all those things. So this is how they are playing out. For example, let's start uh, with the bottom figure on the NMOS so that I can walk you through how it works. So in NMOS, the current flows along the green channel. So that's the source and that's the drain on the other side, the green channel. And the yellow is the gate. And so electrons, this is done on 110 plane. 110 plane, and the electrons are flowing from uh, source to drain along 001 plane. So in this plane, they have a good mobility. So that's why you do it in this particular way. But for PMOS, you see, which is on the top, you have the current flowing in the blue region from the source to drain, but you have one, one bar, zero direction. That's where people have experimentally seen that you have higher mobility. These are all strain transistors, by the way. So you already have a biaxial strain, and then on top of it, uh, you have a structure like this. Now, you do not really have to understand the details of how it works. So only thing I want to point out that these days, orientation dependence, and thereby enhancing the gain, is uh, enhancing the mobility, is a big game in the town. So that's something you should be just, just be aware of. 
So it's no longer just one zero zero plain old silicon for last 50 years, no longer. People are trying all sorts of things, putting this NMOS and PMOS in different direction. There's a corresponding uh, figure for FinFETs. And again, people are experimenting with all sorts of uh, efforts like this. So for example, here you have the channel, again, uh, PMOS about the same, uh, going from the green, in the green region, and you see the gate. But the NMOS for a FinFET, remember this three-sided uh, device that we talked about? And so in that one, even a if you put it in a slight angle, that gives you better mobility. Now again, don't have to understand the details of it, why it happens, that we'll learn in advanced courses. But in 606, you should at least know what people are doing and why they might be doing such a thing. Okay, so the silicon is sort of, is almost done. Silicon is sort of running out of steam in significant ways. People are therefore trying to do strain, trying to do various orientation, they are going as far as they can go, and still it's difficult for people to see how you can continue for next 15 years. Very difficult for people to see. So therefore, they are thinking about getting rid of silicon. Now, if you had to get rid of silicon and invent the silicon industry, quote unquote, once more, what did you have done? You said, said okay, let me go back and see what material has good mobility, because mobility is sort of important. So you go, go around the table, you look at silicon, well, 300. These are, of course, uh, inversion mobility. And gallium arsenide, well, pretty good, 7,000. But if you really had to make one, you'd, which material you'd make? You'd make indium antimonide, right? 30,000. You cannot beat it. So 30,000, we should make one. And this is that's something exactly what people are doing. So this would be a structure that was published, I think, last year's International Electron Device Meeting. Lots of complicated structure, but the bottom line is it should not, you shouldn't be worried. Look at this. This is essentially a uh, MOSFET. You can see the source and drain, right? Titanium gold source and drain, and you have a corresponding gate. And the channel where the electron actually flows is that 5 nanometer, the uh, magenta region or the red region, 5 nanometer indium antimonide quantum well, that's where the electrons would flow, 30,000. So people are hoping that on NMOS, electron side, yes, this would be a good thing to have, very good thing to have. Now, what would you do in terms of holes? You know, holes, you're not, holes for, you need for PMOS, right? For PMOS, holes goes from source to drain. What are you going to do about that? Well, in that case, you see, none of them are actually giving you much, right? 450, 400, 200, well, it's not, not, not great. What are you going to do then? Well, if you really had your option, then you wouldn't make PMOS with any of this material at all. You'd make it, oh, by the way, before, before that, uh, on the NMOS side, finishing in, on that, uh, NMOS side, this is something, a paper I posted from Nature uh, 2009 on the website. People are also thinking about graphene which has a mobility, people say, 100,000, not 30,000, 100,000. And people are thinking about making transistors out of that also. Now, for PMOS, what you do you have done? Well, PMOS, at least for, uh, for the holes, you would pick germanium. The germanium it has about 1,900, a factor of five more than silicon. That would be great. I put a star on the electron column is not because this value of the germanium in electron mobility is not known, bulk mobility is known, but I did not find a value for the inversion layer germanium mobility value, so that I didn't put in there. But the point is, uh, that is relatively low, far lower compared to indium antimonide, but uh, for PMOS side, germanium is great. So, if you had to design all over again, you'd make a indium antimonide, or maybe graphene uh, in MOS, and you'd make a germanium PMOS. In fact, a lot of work are already underway in which they are trying to do exactly that. Now, this is in some way comes back, life comes back in full circle because germanium was the first PNP transistor 
uh, that was made. Remember that point contact register? It was made of germanium. And it was, that's why in all textbooks, they always do P and P. Because what is the minority carrier here in the PNP transistor? Hose, right? And it's the minority carrier mobility which makes, sense, makes the difference. And so therefore, all the original germanium transistors were PNP because that had very high hole diffusion coefficient. Hole mobility higher, diffusion coefficient higher by Einstein relationship, D over mu is KT over Q. Now, uh, but the main problem why this disappeared was this band gap is small. How much is the germanium's band gap? 0.65 to 0.75, something like that. And so it was very noisy. Germanium transistor, even at room temperature, was had a lot of generation events, recombination generation events. So there was a lot of noise in germanium. And moreover, you couldn't grow oxide on germanium. Germanium oxide doesn't exist. So therefore, silicon, which had a higher band gap, and on which you could grow beautiful oxide, that essentially took over. But now we are coming back in full circle and trying germanium uh, one more time. At the end, you should realize that this is the oxide, not the material itself. That dictates the choice of what material you make MOSFETs out of. It doesn't really almost matter. If you don't have a great oxide, to prevent the current flow, it doesn't matter what material you choose because at the end your uh, interface will sort of eliminate all advantages that you had. So to summarize then, uh, as I mentioned that short channel effect is a serious concern for MOSFET scaling and for essentially uh, you try different things, thin oxide, high K dielectric, shallow source and drain, you do all sorts of things. But the problem has been that for last three, four technology generations, the oxide has not scaled very much at all uh, because too much gate leakage. It's already one nanometer. If you go any thinner, then essentially uh, it will become a bipolar transistor, lateral bipolar transistor. So that's, that's a big problem. That's why people are trying all sorts of new things. Now, this is, uh, people are trying many novel solutions for material, for example, intium antimonide device structures, so remember the fin fate, planar structures, right, omega fate, all sorts of things. And on circuit level, there are lots of tricks uh, that people are, people are working with. Now, at the end, because you have put everything together, that is why these days it's possible to uh, think about, on commercial scale, a 30 nanometer channel length uh, transistor. Do you know how small 30 nanometer is. One nanometer is five atoms, right? That's about it. One nanometer, two angstrom, remember two angstrom is the spacing. One nanometer, five atoms. 30 nanometer, 150 atoms. You have 150 atoms between source and drain. That's all you have. And to achieve that level of integration and at that low a price is fantastic. And that only happens because all these innovations in material, devices and circuits are going on simultaneously. Okay, so I will end here and uh, we'll pick up in the next class.